like I was, I was almost like oh, off this planet, my approach to design because I was so questioning and challenging of briefs uh, because I, I guess because of my research, I knew that there were wider um, approaches and perspectives around the way in which schools could be and the way in which learning took place. Hello and welcome to the Doyen Interviews with me, Bridget Nathan. This is the podcast that speaks to inspiring women from the art, architecture and design world. Shout out to Anon for the beautiful introductory music and also thanks to Grace Yeo for illustrating all the episodes. This season is sponsored by Coolon LED Lighting. Coolon is actually a female-led Australian-owned architectural lighting manufacturer based in Melbourne. The Doyen Interviews acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. We pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. So hello and welcome to the next episode of the Doyen Interviews. Uh, Today we're speaking to Fiona Young and Natalia Krushak from Habel in Sydney. Um, We'll be discussing many things. They're both education specialists, um, which is an interest of mine. So I'm really excited to hear a little bit more about their backgrounds. Um, But we'll also be talking about adaption and what's been going on at the moment for them. Um, So uh, Fiona, it would be great if you could introduce yourself first and then maybe Nat afterwards. Sure. Hi. My name's Fiona Young and I'm a studio director at Hable Architects and I'm also a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne. And I'm Natalia Krushek. I am an associate at Hable Architects. Um, and I'm also a researcher working on a series of uh, research projects around playful urban environments. What What is this research project? Cities for Play is um, an organisation that aims to inspire developers, planners uh, and architects, as well as communities, to create more playful and child-friendly cities. So I run a blog, but also uh, run talks and workshops exploring how the built environment can promote children's health and well-being. And I think this interest um, really stems from my childhood. Uh, As a child, my parents moved around a lot. We lived in different neighbourhoods all around the world. We lived in some very high-density cities as well as low-density cities. And really, the built environment always had a very significant effect on my childhood, and I was always really sensitive to, to to the environment in which I lived in. And really the design of of my immediate surroundings meant that I was either constrained um, or enabled uh, me to to experience really rich childhood um, experiences such as playing outside with friends or even being able to independently access the spaces around me, walk to school, walk to the shop. All of these things uh, really created quite a rich uh, childhood for me. And so this has always fascinated me and throughout my university studies and now throughout my career, um, it's just been a complete passion of, of mine on, on how it is that we can affect, uh, that we can design neighbourhoods and, and design buildings to, uh, to have a positive health and wellbeing effect on children. And of course, I've been really fortunate to explore this topic uh, through some of the research grants, including the David Lindner Research Grant which is um, something that the New South Wales Institute of Architects um, is a prize through, through the Institute as well as the Churchill Fellowship, which has allowed me to travel the world and, and explore some of these topics in a bit more detail. Wow, that is like amazing, incredible. Um, congratulations on that. I feel like now that we've gotten to the first question, we could actually do a whole episode just on that. <laughs> I have so many questions. Um, but having started this, what are some of the things that you learnt um, on, like, whilst you were overseas? Like, um, what are some of the takeaways that you've, yeah, experienced through this, through going and having a look at different places where people are playing? Mm. Well, I suppose for me, play has always been a really, really interesting topic. Um, And 
some of kind of the, ins the inspiring linguists and historians that have that have written about play really argue that that play is key to, to us developing as human beings um, and, and key to our innovation as, as human beings. So play to me has always been fascinating and, and really enabling uh, our built environment to, um, to create those playful experiences, particularly for children, given that play is such a fundamental part um, of the way in which children develop. But really what I learned as I was traveling is that the, the cities that value children um, and their experiences are the ones that are typically the most child-friendly cities. So for example, when I was traveling in Japan, I was lucky enough to be there during uh, the Japanese Children's Day. And during this day, all of the streets were covered in um, children's drawings, there were beautiful symbols around children and the value that children have in a society. Um, and there was kind of this celebration of childhood, which was extremely inspiring. One of the um, uh, university professors that I spoke with in Japan, he um, said to me that it's often said that it takes a village to raise a child. But for him, what was really important that it also takes a child to raise a village. And that to me was really core to the way that the Japanese people really think about children, that it's not just our responsibility as adults to look after children and provide them with safe environments, but it's also the potential that children have to completely reframe the way that we think as adults and the power that, that they have to create a far more empathetic, um, and sustainable and connected communities. I'm thinking a lot about adaption because that's um, a key theme to a lot of people's lives considering the global um, situation. When you think about children and adaption and play, um, what comes to mind for you? I think that when we think about play, it's really a behaviour that allows us to constantly push our limits. So it really allows us to test the boundaries of our physical, mental, and our social abilities and prepare ourselves for the unknown. So the linguist Johann Huizinger, um, he says this beautiful uh, quote that repetition is a ritual while play is innovation. So through play, there are no real consequences which means that you can go beyond what's ordinary because there's nothing stopping you from going beyond your immediate uh, reality. And that really creates this agility and resilience because we're constantly pushing scenarios to extend possibilities um, and transcend the boundaries of what we know. And this kind of attitude, of a playful mind and attitude is, is really core, I think, to adaptation. And um, so being someone that's able to be flexible and think beyond uh, their immediate scenario, someone that's adaptable is, in my mind, also someone that's quite playful. It's a, it sounds to me from what you're saying that we can learn a lot from children <laughs> um, and their, yes. their ways. Um, Fiona, to introduce you... Um, you're, yeah, you're undertaking a PhD at the moment, which is um, amazing. Um, so I'm really, really interested to know um, a bit more about it. And yeah, it would be great if you could introduce um, what it's about to the audience. Sure. So um, I'm actually, I feel very lucky because I'm doing my PhD as part of a greater team and it's this PhD is part of an Australian Research Council project and it's called the Innovative Learning Environments and Teacher Change Project, which is ILETC for short, and it's being run through the Learning Environments Applied Research Network at the University of Melbourne. So it's an interdisciplinary project. So I, in there as an architect, there's one other architect, but there's also others who are from education and museum educator backgrounds. So it's been incredibly rich for me to be doing a PhD in, a, in this way, having teammates and not being totally isolated. And my PhD, as part of this project, is about the affordances of learning environments that supports student deep learning. And I guess it's 
what I mean by affordances are aspects of the physical environment, which enables teaching and learning activities, which support student deep learning. And if, if you go into that, I, I think on one level it sounds pretty straightforward. As an architect, it's like you design a space and somebody uses it. But I think what's really interesting about the concept is that, uh, and, and particularly I guess I'm looking at it through the lens of schools and education and teaching practice. Um, so in terms of learning environments, it's not just about space, but it's about how teachers recognise the potential of space in order to be able to use it. And it's also about the influences around teachers that enable them to use these affordances or be inhibited um, in using them because of constraints around them. Just to add on to um, onto that, I think one of the things that really struck me when I first joined Hable um, and started working with Fiona was this, I, I guess she just opened up this whole new world for me uh, of the world of research um, and became kind of a really strong role model for me on, on how to approach building design through a research lens. And I think above anything else, um, what Fiona constantly brings to her practice as an architect is challenging stereotypes of, of how space should and could be used and really deeply understanding um, how behaviours relate to, to spatial design. Um, and I think that's something that you can only learn through through someone that's doing a PhD who's so immersed in a topic and thinking about behaviour and how it relates to space in, in this in this really kind of deep way. What are some of the ways that you guys um, work together to generate ideas about space or to sort of, um, I mean, I've been to your studio last year and it's a, it seems like a very, um, like a space for collaboration or a space for um, like interaction. Um, so what are sort of the methods that, you guys have been doing to come together to yeah draw on this amazing experience of um research that you're you have had that you're currently doing and and to start to apply them to um spatial design i think there's two ways of thinking about the question and one is what do we do in our practice in the way in which we interact with each other to generate thinking and the other one is what do we do and when we work with clients and stakeholders to help them generate uh, responses to some of our questions and then how do we synthesise that in order to come up with the responses. I think Nat and I, we communicate a lot and we, we often talk about our research beyond projects so we constantly know where we can draw upon each other's strengths and knowledge and I think because of the fact that we are so embedded in our research, a lot of the thinking about possibilities of how our research can be applied to projects is quite almost intuitive and, and quite innate in the way in which we work and think. And I think a big part of that also comes from this idea of, of co-creating uh, with, with clients and, and with user groups too, um, which has been a, a really fascinating also experience in, in regards to, to the COVID situation now. We've run a couple of uh, digital workshops working with, with clients um, and it's been a, a very interesting process looking at how you can enter into um, understanding how a client might use a space um, or, or how they currently use their, their spaces, but getting that information in a digital realm has been quite a challenge, but I suppose um, also created some really interesting opportunities for us too. Mm. I think it's uh, and going back to what I said before in terms of the processes in which we work with other people, whether they're children or adults, is actually an incredibly hands-on way in order to help them process and think about some of the things we want to find out. And I think that makes it also quite fun to be, I mean, it's quite playful, in fact, some of our processes in which we communicate and, and uh, with other people. Uh, and so that is challenging now remotely, but we have been developing some really interesting techniques which have still, I think, made it quite playful. Wouldn't you think, Nat? Yes, absolutely. Do you find that stuff that or things that 
children or educators tell you is like really surprising like is there an example of something that's happened recently or like um an interpretation that you thought would be how you know they might see it their experience is totally different I think um whenever we work with children I'm always constantly surprised with some of the things that come up just how perceptive um, children are about the environments around them is often something that um, really kind of blows my mind. I mean, recently um, when I was running a workshop with children in Queensland around um, their neighbourhood, they were they knew um, you know almost every shop on their local strip and where the rubbish was, which smelt really badly, or where the the most beautifully smelling flowers were planted. They knew all of these incredible details um, about the built environment that as a designer coming in, you simply wouldn't have, um, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to know without that insight from them. So I think it's just giving the ownership to, to whether it be a, the, the child that's going to be using the space at the end of the day or the client themselves, whoever it might be, giving them ownership over their, over their building and allowing them to have a really strong voice in that process. I, I'd agree with that too, and, and I've found through my practice that it's invaluable consulting with students in an incredibly genuine way because they do open our minds amazingly, um, well beyond you would expect, even you know, as a designer in a creative profession. And I've worked in schools before where often, oh, this is probably even in my early days of education, where you'd be briefed by senior leadership team and that's they tell you how the school's operating and they'd say well but you would never put a building in that area because the students hate that space and I remember in this particular case running it was probably my first workshops with students at the time and it was extremely it was interesting because we got them to do a favorite and least favorite places exercise and all the students put their favorite place as a place where the the leaders of the school never mentioned ever and the places that they hated the most was where they um was where the adults said was where the building should be and so that was really yeah it was funny but and it also gave us license to be able to delve in and understand their perspective more and in fact that we followed the children's lead in terms of positioning and the building worked incredibly well as a result yeah, it's, you've, Fiona, you've also, um, being a director, you've um, had quite an extensive career in education design. I believe you worked at um, BVN before you were at Habel. You noticed that there, apart from um, the examples that you you'd already mentioned, ha have there been many changes in um, education design? Um, do you think that we're entering into different times now or... Um, yeah, what's that sort of process been like for you working in this area? Yeah, I, I definitely think there's been some quite positive changes. And I do yeah. recall um, early on when I was, I guess, in my earlier phase of research and education design, and as Nat mentioned earlier, kind of bringing questions to the table which challenged stereotypes. And I um, recall often being questioned by architects like I was I was almost like oh, off this planet my approach <laughs> to design because I was so questioning and challenging of briefs uh, because I I guess because of my research I knew that there were wider um, approaches and perspectives around the way in which schools could be and the way in which learning took place and I think many of the architects which may have challenged me earlier were ones that are much more used to a traditional approach where you get given a brief and the client is the expert in that field and therefore the brief is what is what, what holds in terms of the way you go forward. But I think um, what's changed over time, I guess, firstly, people are starting to be a bit more open to other possibilities for learning environments because they're recognising the need for more diverse pedagogies in order to prepare students for 
a changing uh, landscape beyond what schools were originally designed for, which was an industrial model of learning and therefore specific skills that you needed to emerge from school from. So you know, I find this context around me now at, at Havel is fantastic because everyone recognises uh, and appreciates bringing this perspective to projects um, and also I think often clients come to us too because they're, they're really keen on our depth of understanding and the, being able to bring research in order to help them understand the potential as well because I guess you know educators are fantastic and they're really great at learning but they don't really have the time to think about space and what's happening at the forefront of learning space and that's where we can help them. Yeah and especially um, when you think about like yeah everything you have already you both have already mentioned like the possibilities of space and the possibilities of technology um, at the moment um, to really challenge us and um, to get us thinking. You think about spaces, like educational spaces, do you think that they're meeting our needs at the moment in total in Australia? Or do you think that there's room, like a lot of room to do things differently? I think that there um, are definitely plenty of examples in Australia that, that show what um, what a future of education could look like. But there's certainly a lot of room for improvement. Um, and I'm sure Fiona could even add some statistics around how many schools are still um, looking at, at a lot more formal sorts of environments for education and really lacking in those um, more innovative, I suppose, environments. But I think taking back to what what Fiona was saying previously, there, there is this um, real keen understanding of, of the need to develop these 21st century skills that, that we always talk about, the skills such as collaboration, communication, creativity, critical thinking, these sorts of skills that we understand now, um, how important they are more than ever with, with um, everything that's happening in the world, how important it is to develop these sorts of skills in children. And with this comes um, a need to create a more open-ended, I suppose, way of, of learning. Um, so, so creating spaces that aren't necessarily um, for that, that very direct uh, mode of teaching, but maybe more opportunities for more student-led opportunities for, for creating things, for tinkering uh, with different materials, for creating a YouTube video or creating um, a model or 3D um, kind of um, device, whatever it might be, spaces for innovation within schools. And a lot of schools are recognising that and really craving uh, for, those, for those rooms. I mean, in saying that, though, I think, as Fiona was, was saying before, it often comes down to also the, the mindset of, um, of teachers and, and the way that we perceive spaces. I think often... You don't actually need to inter in intervene that much to create a really innovative um, environment. It might just be the mindset that's actually preventing those things from happening in a learning environment or even in a play environment. Yeah, the more that you both are talking, it makes me think that the way that you're, like the type of architecture that you're practising is very human-centred and it's very, um, like, it's considering human psychology and the relationship that has with people. Um, Fiona, what do you think? Well, actually, Nat pointed it out, mentioned that about the statistic that is off the top of my head. <laughs> and I know that at the moment, 70% of learning spaces across Australia and New Zealand are traditional in nature, which is what I mean by that is the cells and bells model of schools. And so there's actually only... Therefore, about 30%, which are what we call these ILEs or innovative learning environments, which enable all these diverse pedagogies that um, Nat's talked about. So, and I mean, there's some really core things which aren't possible in traditional environments. And one of them, for example, is the ability to be able to team teach because you physically can't fit more than one teacher and their students in one classroom. So it 
enable or it disables your ability to be able to team teach in cellular rooms. And when you start to team teach, that starts to open up many more possibilities in terms of um, being able to differentiate learning, uh, to be able to um, engage in interdisciplinary practices. And these are some of the things which start to be really valuable towards some of these 21st century skills that Nat's spoken about earlier. When you mentioned the human-centred thing, I thought, it for me, it also tied back to one your earlier question about what's changed over time in my practice. And I guess in my role, I've always been the person who acts as the bridge between the architectural teams and the educational side of things, the clients. And therefore, I've also been the person who's developed and facilitated the workshops with the students or with the teachers. And I think very much early on, it wasn't something that was seen to be desirable, I think, by more traditionally trained architects. But what I've noticed now, and particularly with at Hayball, is that there's an incredible appetite to be able to utilise or have these types of skills and able to be able to engage with clients and to really deeply understand the context as a result of doing so. And I think for project architects, and you can probably talk to this too, Nat, because you're doing it, um, to have this depth of knowledge that you can take all the way through a project is invaluable in the way in which you make design decisions based on that knowledge that you have at the beginning of a project through the workshops. What's your experience of that, Nat, been? Because a project architect, um, my perspective is that um, I totally agree with everything you're saying, Fiona. It's like um, it's a very technically based role, but if you have that extra level of knowledge especially when it comes to education design or um, you know something that does involve a lot of specialist thinking then the real you know we design buildings to the millimeter most like every architect I would say um so how has that been for you Nat um like yeah the this background knowledge and then um working as a project architect on um creating new educational spaces? I think um, by having that that really deep and honest discussion with, with the user groups themselves, so with the teachers and the students, it does, I think, allow you to challenge those stereotypes about how a space um, should be used or, or could be used. So by understanding um, what their current barriers are and what the possibilities could be into the future, rather than just concentrating on what they already have and, and repeating that just because it's already been done before. Yeah. Um, so I think it's looking at, you know, looking at either play or learning beyond uh, what what we, um, you know, beyond the school or beyond the playground and, and really questioning what it is that makes a space playful or what it is that makes a space appropriate for learning. So what are those affordances, as Fiona was talking about before, you know, what, what can you narrow it down that what are the affordances to create um, a good space for, for direct teaching instruction? So it might be acoustics, it might be that you need um, certain amount of chairs within the space and that might be all that's needed. Um, or for a play space, for example, it might be that all that's needed to create a really playful environment is actually the removal of cars from a street and then all of a sudden you can create um, a play street where kids can come out and enjoy a playful environment. So it's really um, understanding what the challenges are, what the barriers are beyond what we um, what what we know from this repetitive sort of way of working, but instead looking at well, how can we create more innovative um, spaces by really deeply understanding what the opportunities and barriers are faced by the user groups um, and by the clients. Yeah. Yeah. And is there an example of a project that um, perhaps uh, Fiona, you might like to introduce that both of you have worked on together that um, you'd want to talk about? Well, actually, what a project which both Nat and I worked on last year was a concept proposal which we developed with Tezuka Architects for the 
Qatar Foundation, and it was for a future school. And it was really exciting because it was very much around challenging um, the nature of a traditional school in order to be able to prepare young Qataris for a completely uh, a, a future vision for education in order to be agile and adaptable for this, very, this rapidly changing world. So the this school tapped into lots of great ideas in terms of um, stage, not age learning, learning communities, um, STEAM, or sorry, using acronyms here, sci- um, science, technology, uh, engineering, arts and maths types of programs, bridging real life learning, authentic learning. Um, it was it was a pretty exciting project and it very much bridged our thinking around, I guess, the formal and the informal and also the idea of a school which actually felt more like a cultural institution. What was it like working? I mean, that, that practice is the one they've got that, um, I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with it. It's the, um, am I right in saying it's the kindergarten, they've done a kindergarten project where you can traverse the roof. Is that one of the ones that you um, visited when you were on your trip? Yes, the Fuji kindergarten. I did, yes. That's one of the ones I visited. And I also, um, in my travels, I also interviewed Tezuka Architects. Um, so um, with um, with some of the work that they do, I mean, they are so deeply embedded with um, with environments for children. And there's some incredibly beautiful um, design um, thinking that goes behind their work in creating spaces for children. And we're quite lucky um, that, that we've had the opportunity to, to work with Tezuka Architects um, on a number of projects. But um, some of the things that, um, that, they'll, that they'll do in their designs is, for example, um, a door will be designed in such a way that it requires quite a bit of force to completely shut. Um, and that's done in order to embed in children a sense of responsibility to shut the doors uh, correctly and accurately so that the wind doesn't come through um, or they make sure you know that the heights of the ceilings uh, are really low so that children actually feel comfortable in the spaces. Often you, you don't really think about the size of the height of rooms when we design spaces for children but in fact often children will feel quite overwhelmed in these spaces that are really designed for adults. Um, or even imprinting in the ground um, little symbols for where your slippers go near the door so that the children know where to place their slippers before they enter into the space. So just thinking about um, the development of children and even just their physical scale and how much thought that requires. So when we're working with Suzuka Architects on the Qatar Future School, a lot of this thinking really, really went into the project. And it was trying to understand um, how, as a child and as a learner, you w- you would have a very different experience um, compared to all of the other students students in, in the in the school, and how important it is to to create um, a kind of diverse and tailored experience for every student. So we imagined that as you would enter into the future school, the Qatar future school, you would be greeted by a robot. Um, where you could type in what your program might be for today. So you might decide that today you want to do a cooking class in the morning and then in the afternoon you might want to do um, a session on microbiology. And so as Fiona was saying, it wouldn't matter so much what age you were because it's more so to do with stage. So you could pick to join a a year 10 class for one subject and then a year 9 class for a different subject. It wouldn't matter so much. Um, so with technology and with more innovative learning environments, hopefully we could create kind of this, this bridging of what a more self-directed learning might look like, but also bridging the boundaries between what a gallery is, what a museum is, and how a school could be embedded within these more um, cultural institutions. So creating really exciting spaces where you walk into the school and you see maybe a robot game happening uh, 
on the floor in front of the lobby, or you might have drones flying around above you sorting the, the homework for the day. So all of these really exciting and innovative um, sort of technological solutions um, that might come into um, to a, to a future school. Wow, that sounds so amazing. It sounds like some sort of robotic version of Harry Potter, but in a very beautifully <laughs> designed, like I'm thinking this, I'm imagining like this really poetic, like Tadeo Ando type space but with like robots and teaching and learning and this is a little bit of a curveball question but it kind of follows on if you could think about um I mean you've sort of already mentioned the project that you worked on which was a school of the future but if you either of you could have any type of project just say it was based in Australia if you could work on an educational design project um like, what would it be if you could choose something as an example? Like, um, for example, you know, a school, like what would be in the school? Or like if it was um, an outdoor play area, like what's something that you imagine that we need or that um, could be useful to people that doesn't exist or we could need more of? Um, I actually think that um, instead of thinking about spaces for play or, or playgrounds or schools, we should be, in fact, trying to break down some of those barriers. I think that's something that could be one of the positive things that, that emerges out of the COVID pandemic is this new understanding, I guess, of what a learning environment could be like or even of what a play environment could be like. So with, for example, the closure of playgrounds within our neighbourhood, I think this has created um, some new and exciting ways uh, that we're seeing children playing within within our neighbourhoods. Um, so instead of automatically thinking that play should be um, only something that, that happens within a formal playground enclosure, in fact, if we really consider the complexity of play as a behaviour, um, it would be great if we could diversify our response to this complex behaviour in within our physical environment. So creating more open-ended opportunities for play, whether play can happen uh, on, on a street or in a museum uh, or in a park, um, wherever it might be, rather than defining a zone for play or defining even a zone for learning, how can we can actually create um, those, those more open-ended and diverse opportunity for, for children into the future? So I think, yeah, for, for me, it's looking at... Um, entire cities being spaces for play and learning rather than just designated designating zones within our cities for, for that um, to occur within enclosed spaces. I think I have to agree with you, Nat. I think uh, at the moment everything's quite defined that the idea that school is where you go to learn and a playground where the stereotypical playgrounds we see and that's where you go to play. And I think I, that it is important to be able to uh, be a bit more fluid around those definitions in order to be able to support and engage not just children but uh, you know, whole populations to engage more with learning. And I think um, the thing that there's a real opportunity now to reimagine what schools could or should be like. I think in the past it's always been... It is challenging to think about something which people may not have any experience with at all. So often when I have worked on projects where we've wanted, or people, clients have wanted to look at new models of school, people have only really been able to draw upon this industrial model of schooling because that's where adults have gone to school in those environments and that's where students are going to school now. So it's very hard to imagine something different but I think now with, I think it's about 80% of the world's population of students who normally go to formal schooling aren't there at the moment. And whilst I think there are huge, it's brought up huge challenges and raised lots of issues around the social aspect of schooling and inequity, what I think at, at a positive level, what it has done is given people another lens to view learning through. And so I think in order to be able to shift education at all, I think it's something that it's important to do with the young people and 
with a much more informed audience now in terms of recognising that there's other ways of doing things and that perhaps school doesn't need to be in one place from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock or 9 to 5, from going from one lesson to another every single day, but perhaps it can have a lot more diversity and whether some of that's working, learning from home, some of it is in a common place that you come to or maybe it's distributed so that there's multiple bases that could be within inst- cultural institutions or within uh, the CBD, for instance. Fiona, do you have any um, comments about adaption? Very much relates to what I've observed in my research of watching and being part of teachers' adaptations to new types of learning spaces is that there's some key points along the process that um, are required and enable for it to be successful. And I think one of them is that it's really important to have the space and the time to be able to observe the current context around you and to be able to reflect. Uh, so therefore, by doing so, you become quite conscious of where you're at now, uh, which then opens you up for more possibilities so that you can be bridging where you've come from to where you are now and where you're going to. And I guess in a way with COVID, it's given us all an opportunity to pause and reflect and hopefully adapt as we move forward. Yeah, I really like that way of thinking, thinking about, um, yeah, this breakdown of barriers of where we do learn and where we can learn. Do you think that there could be um, or what are your thoughts on that in regards to um, women and our roles? Like, do you think COVID has potentially changed a couple of things or do you think it will have um, an effect on – I'm not quite sure what my question is. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, like, the relationship between, like, before and kind of the saying to me – is that a lot of our spaces are quite separate for things that we do, but maybe there's an opportunity for the barriers to be broken down a little bit. Um, do you think that having like COVID having happened could maybe help with breaking down some of the barriers to do with like what can sometimes limit women in the workforce or um, People are recognising that you can work from home, and that's a huge barrier. I mean, I, I think in terms of being able to work flexibly, which is a huge asset to uh, not just women but all people in the workforce, but particularly, I mean, I guess people with children, people who have who are having babies, that. Um, it doesn't mean that your career has to stop as a result of that because you can work in many different ways and you can work from home. I think the other um, opportunity that that will come with more people working from home is this this, uh, re-emergence, I guess, of the importance of the neighbourhood around you um, and how potentially with more people working from home during the day, we can create far more... um, 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 I guess, far more exciting and active local communities. And I think that's that's a great thing, not just for adults, but also particularly for children, having that experience with connecting with their communities around them, having opportunities in the afternoon to go out and play with their neighbours um, that they might get to know more with more people working from home. So I think that could be a really exciting, um, positive thing that comes out of this, is this um, need, I guess, for the immediate local neighbourhood to become your base. Um, And with that, I think, will um, come plenty of opportunities to create stronger stronger communities. And I also think that, um, like, situations like this, which um, cause change in people's routines, there's always learning that comes from change. And when children or adults... Um, you know, we're used to going to work every day or we're used to going to school or, you know, to this, like, certain place to do this certain thing. Yeah, there is a lot to learn there, obviously. But when you change that, like, so radically, like, how 
has been, I think that people maybe would have learnt things that they didn't expect. Um, and, yeah, I'm really interested to know how that will, I don't know, affect people. And, yeah, learning is something that is sporadic. <laughs> yeah, and I think the other thing that I guess where we're, we're recognising is just how much we rely on open space and on public spaces to create those connections between us as communities um, and provide us with that retreat, both for our mental health and our physical health, and how important it is, especially as our cities constantly densify, become more vertical, how important it is to protect those public assets to enable us to, to enjoy those sorts of spaces. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, <laughs> thank you both so much. Thank you so much for your time and good luck with everything um, in the future. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks so much, Bridget. Thanks, Fiona and Nat. Next week, we'll be chatting to two women from Clark Hopkins Clark. Like if you walk onto any major hospital campus in Melbourne and even around regionally in the state there's always changes happening there's always some level of capital project going on and often that is actually pulling out existing facilities and redeveloping them to suit new models of care 